As we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray together. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your, your loving word, your correction, your teaching, all of that to reveal more and more of who you are to us. And God, I pray that as we receive your word this morning, that we would have our hearts attentive to how you want to speak to us, to what you would have to say. We pray that we would place aside any distractions or any things that prevent us from hearing you this morning. Lord, would you speak um, through me, the preacher, that all the words that come out of my mouth would be from you and of you, Lord. We pray that you would be honored and glorified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's scripture reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light that consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. We respond by saying, praise be to God. I remember spending many, many years in Chinese school learning and honing my Cantonese. But somewhere around grade six or seven, I don't, I don't remember exactly when, it dawned on me or it occurred to me that the majority of Chinese people, 95% of Chinese people don't speak Cantonese, but in fact speak Mandarin. And I had spent so many painstaking years, this was a big deal for me as a grade six or seven student, painstaking years learning a language that such a small portion of my people spoke. I was more than a little disappointed when I found out all my hard work for naught. Mandarin, an entirely different dialect, and even the writing, all the characters that I had spent memorizing, time memorizing, were a little different. This was more pronounced when my parents moved to China for a few years. Um, they spent some time living in Shanghai. And while they were there, I made a few visits uh, across the sea, across the ocean to, to visit them. And where I could get around with speaking and understanding Cantonese in a city like Hong Kong and to be honest, in a city like Markham, I had a much, much harder time in Shanghai. I couldn't read what was written, I couldn't speak, I couldn't understand, I couldn't do very much. On one occasion, my dad and I went out to buy a winter jacket. And when I had finally decided on one jacket, my dad was chatting with the retail worker, uh, talking about the price or the material and all that stuff. And the conversation went on for a little bit and, and after a while, 
the worker turned to my dad and asked if I was mute because I didn't say anything. And my dad chuckled and explained that I wasn't mute, but it was just that I didn't speak and I didn't understand Mandarin. I was literally just off to the side, zoning out. This was before the days of smartphones and, and I just sort of stood there hanging out. And so this retail worker, ah, with understanding. But really, I felt she was a little disappointed that a Chinese person couldn't speak Chinese in China. And so it wasn't that I didn't speak any Chinese. I want to be very clear. I just wasn't speaking the same dialect. I wasn't speaking Mandarin. And to this day, I speak very minimal Mandarin. But not only that, like I said, I couldn't pay for myself. I couldn't ask the staff questions. I couldn't interact with her in any way. I was far from a functioning adult in that moment. And I was far from being recognizable as a local Chinese person. I stood out. I spoke a different language. I might have looked the part, but I, I spoke a different language and I couldn't, I couldn't function in that, in that environment. And so all that to say, in our passage today, Paul gives plenty of instruction for how a Christian is to speak and how they are to conduct themselves in order to be recognizable. It's a continuation from the previous chapter of putting off the old self and putting on the new self. And so Paul urges the church in verse 1 of our chapter today, where he tells them that they are God's beloved children. And as God's beloved children, they are to follow his example, to, to be imitators of God. And so Paul begins by listing a whole host of sins that the Christian should have no part and so he begins in verse 3 of our passage today. Paul says this, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Sexual immorality, impurity, these were woven into their f the fabric of their society. These were woven into the cult worship they practiced um, sexual immorality. They would sleep with cult prostitutes or, or just to worship their, their false gods. All of this was practiced in their society. The wealthy elite practiced sexual immorality, sleeping with, um, with, with uh, underage boys and, and practicing all these heinous things. And so this was very familiar in their society. And Paul instructs the church that they were to have no part in any of these activities. And so we recognize how ugly and how heinous and how hideous these sins of sexual immorality are. But Paul also groups very curiously greed with these impure actions. Greed is this strong, selfish desire to have more of something. You know, most often it's, it's more money or more power, maybe more influence. But Paul explains in verse 5 of our passage that the greedy person is an idolater, is a sinner just the same. And in this context, grouped together with sexual immorality. Before we go far, too far, um, on too far, there is a parallel passage in Colossians chapter 3, where Paul outlines the same things of putting off the old self and putting on the new self. And in, in that same parallel passage, Sexual immorality and greed or coveting for more are linked together. In the Mosaic Law, God's instruction to his holy people are to not covet their neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. That's what God says in his holy law in Exodus chapter 20. At its core, Greed and envy stem from being dissatisfied with what you have. With sexual immorality, it's this lustful desire that works in the same way as greed. Wanting something that is not meant for you in your season, or in your circumstance, or in your relationship. Sex in the confines of marriage is a good thing. But outside of that confines, it is sinful. It is immoral. 
when we want to break those confines out of a desire for, for more, more pleasure, that is sin. It's seeing what another has. It's seeing another person lustfully and desiring that for yourself, taking that for yourself, that crosses into sin. And we see why sexual immorality and coveting are linked together. But for some of you, as I'm speaking to you this morning, some of you, your struggle isn't with lustful thoughts, or your struggle isn't with pornography, or, or having a, an extramarital affair. But all of us, at some level, struggle with coveting. Coveting or envying is this dissatisfaction that leads to, that, that begins with us seeing another's finances or career or grades or relationships or circumstance and, and being dissatisfied with what we have. And it leads to this grumbling and complaining before God. God, this isn't right in my life or, or that isn't going the way I hoped. And what happens is we compare these areas of frustration, these, these low lights of ours with the highlights of other people. And that's exacerbated all the more with social media. And so it begins, and it begins in this cycle of grumbling and complaining before the Lord. Lord, this isn't right in my life. You're good, right? But why is this not right in my life? Admittedly, for myself, um, there's areas where I covet. And over the last couple of weeks, or more pronounced in the last couple of weeks during my vacation, I really noticed how much I was grumbling and complaining or being frustrated with being single. And I must admit, it is, it is challenging. It is hard. Um, you know, at one level, wanting to have that friendship or companionship or that somebody. But I recognize in my own reflection before God, I noticed how I was praying. It became more about complaining and grumbling and coveting with what I was seeing around me. I was envious of what others had and what I felt I missed out on. And, and I was praying this prayer, grumbling and complaining, in my, in my apartment. I had moved back to my apartment. And as I opened my eyes, I took to noticing this beautiful, abundant blessing around me, this apartment that I lived in, furnished in a way that I felt comfortable calling home. And as I took to noticing all these things around me, my mindset shifted from grumbling and complaining to thanksgiving. I was so focused on one area of my life, one area of my life that I felt was frustrating or, or not satisfactory, that I neglected to see the other areas, the other blessings and graces that God had poured out on me. Some areas that, you know, some people might even be praying for to see those realities I was living in. But I was so laser focused on what I didn't have. The Lord hadn't forgotten me. The Lord had showered me with so many other blessings. And so it took me moving myself away from being laser focused to seeing the full picture of what God had already given me, had already done for me. Thanksgiving becomes the remedy to greed and, gr and grumbling and coveting. Eugene Peterson vividly translates verse 4 of our main passage this way. Thanksgiving is our dialect. Thanksgiving is the way that God's people speak. That's the way they're recognized by the thanks that's on their lips. Thanksgiving, the words of praise and adoration and appreciation for what God has given us is key to confronting a world of sin. Thanksgiving is the key to holy living. Notice in our passage today, Paul had listed off sexual immorality, impurity, greed, obscenity, foolish talking, coarse joking, 
And all of that is replaced by this one singular word, rather thanksgiving in verse 4. Thanksgiving is the key. The Greek word for thanksgiving translates into this English word that we use, Eucharist. Although that term might be not too familiar in our church setting, the Eucharist is another name for communion or for the Lord's Supper. And it's aptly named Eucharist because as we partake and we remember Christ's giving of his body and his blood for us, for our salvation, we can't help but be thankful. Eucharist. That's the remedy. When our eyes are fixed on Christ, on what he has done, and, and how he's already so abundantly blessed us, we can't help but speak the language of God. We can't help but speak the dialect of thanksgiving. That's how we are to be recognized, first in our speech. Now, as Paul was writing this to his listeners, in the midst of them, there were others going around and saying to our original listeners, telling the church that they could continue to live in unrepentant sin, that they could, you know, after professing Christ as their Savior, that they could live in sin without consequence, that God's grace was free, and so they could continue to live as they pleased. And so Paul instructs the church in verses 6 and 7 that they aren't to be, they aren't to be deceived by these empty words and not to be partners with those who have twisted the gospel or those who lived in unrepentant sin. This is just a note, but I want to be clear. This isn't to mean that we aren't to associate with those who have twisted the gospel, that we aren't to associate with those who are non-believers. Rather, it is not joining them in their sin. Paul explains further on how we are to interact and conduct ourselves. But first he begins in verse 8, a very key verse to his letter to the Ephesians. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. This sort of encapsulates Paul's theology and certainly his letter to the Ephesians. Once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Paul describes in chapter 2 that those who follow the course of the world belong to Satan. They are known as sons of disobedience in chapter 2, seeking only to gratify the desires of their flesh. They continue to live in habitual, unrepentant sin, affirming their sonship of the evil one. With how they live, they affirm who they belong to. Those who belong to darkness live as if they belong to darkness. Those who belong to light live as children of light. And so with Jesus' blood purchasing our salvation and freedom, we are now to be imitators of God, his beloved children. And, his, and as children, we bear his resemblance. We have tra been transformed by Christ. And so verse 8 takes us from an indicative indicating what God has already done and accomplished in Christ, followed by the imperative, meaning to live as children of light. First, the indicative indicating what has happened, followed by God's instruction to live as children of light. So people take on the sphere in which they live. Once they lived in darkness and were darkness, but now they live in light and are light. So how would others identify you with how you live your life? Does it resemble your father? Would they say that is a child of light? Or is that a child of darkness? Is God's light recognizable with how you live. Because as a child of light, as children of light, the fruit in one's life consists of goodness, righteousness, and truth. And God instructs that these, that with goodness, righteousness, and truth, the role of children of light are to expose those things done in the dark. 
We see that in verse 11 to 13, exposing those things done in the dark, exposing what is in the dark for, for how ugly, for how heinous, how sinful it is. The light exposes the failed promises and shortcomings of living in sin. The light exposes sin for what it really is. It confronts sin. I told you that I recently moved back to my apartment. And for those that didn't know, I lived very shortly in my apartment and then COVID came and I decided to move home. And over the last few months, I've been living at my parents' house until recently I moved back. And I would go into my apartment uh, once a week, you know, to collect the mail or to check to make sure that there were no leaks or any problems in my apartment unit. And as I moved back uh, for the last week or two, as I was settling in this week, um, I was going to put something in one of the cabinets. I noticed this really pungent, it smelled of beef. I know it's not beef, but it was a really pungent beef smell that came out of one of my cabinets. And as I looked to my horror, I saw this bag of onions that had been left in this cabinet for months. And, and, and I opened this bag and there was this sprouting going on with my onions that I kid you not, looked like something out of an alien movie. I was horrified, I quickly closed it. It smelled terrible. And under where these onions had sat, there was this black sludge. Oh God, it was a complete disaster and it was so, it was terrifying. I took it, I bundled it up and I quickly threw it out into the garbage. And thankfully because of COVID, I have a ton of uh, sanitization wipes and so I cleaned it down and after that I, I sanitized it as best I could. But for months, these onions had been rotting and going bad in this dark cabinet. It was completely out of sight and completely out of my mind. But as soon as I opened the door, that huge waft of that pungent odor made its way to my nose. And, I, and, and when I opened it, I was so repulsed by what I had seen. And so I needed to quickly throw it out and do this deep clean of this cabinet. And as children of God, as Christians, we are called to shine his light into the dark places and expose sin. Sin is exposed either in contrast to the holy living of Christians or through direct confrontation. In verse 14 of our passage, Paul quotes what seems to have been a very familiar hymn based on Isaiah chapter 60. Paul says this, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The call is for the spiritually dead to rise up and receive the light of Christ. As I'm speaking this morning, some of you may be struggling with unrepentant sin. It may be sexual sin, it may be watching pornography, it may be greed, it may be coveting, it may be dishonesty. You know what sin it is that you keep coming back to. And it feels safest to hide those sins in the dark, out of view from other Christians. And it's in this dark cabinet of our heart that the sins fester and take root. We believe the deceit of Satan telling us that if we're to bring these things to light, if we're to bring this out into the Christian body, that there's only going to be judgment and harsh condemnation. We believe the deceit of sin where we believe that we can also hold on to these sins secretly while professing to love Christ with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And if this is where you sit or stand this morning, if this is you, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine light on you. Wake up, sleeper. 
author Wayne Mack says this, no matter how many steps you have taken away from God, it's only one step back. No matter how many steps you've taken away from God, it's only one step back. God's grace is sufficient for you. You need only to turn and repent from your sin and return to the goodness of the Lord. He's waiting for you. Wake up, sleeper. Let his truth confront the sin in your life. Let his light shine through. And because we were made, we were made to struggle in our sanctification together in a body of believers. We were made to be authentic and genuine with other Christians. So put down the mask. Don't be full of guilt and shame. In verse 18, Paul says this, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Being filled with the Spirit in this passage isn't a one-time thing. Certainly, those who belong to Christ have been gifted and sealed with the Holy Spirit. But the tense that's used by Paul in this verse is, a, is, is this progressive, ongoing filling of the Spirit. It's a regular pattern of life. The Christian is regularly filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Where sin doesn't take root, where sin doesn't fester in the dark, it is this regular filling of the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God focuses our grumbling and lack, our despair, onto the rich mercies of Christ. Paul outlines three byproducts to someone who is filled with the Spirit. The first two are a deep desire to sing praise, both in solitude and in our personal worship, and also in worship as a community. It's singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. All of that, a natural overflow. When the Christian focuses on the great mercies of God, how can they keep from singing? Who will, will quiet them? There's a fire inside the bones of spirit-filled believers where they cannot help but praise the living God. How can they keep from singing? Praising God, thanking him, singing and declaring who he is. All of these are natural responses to a spirit-filled person. So sing, brothers and sisters. Sing the truths of God. In addition to singing, the third byproduct of someone who is filled with the Spirit, it's an area that we've already talked about today. We see this in verse 20. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always giving thanks singing and singing praise on our own, singing as a corporate body, giving thanks. These are the marks of a spirit-filled life. They put to death sexual immorality. They put to death grumbling, coveting, greed, thanksgiving, focusing on what God has already done and what he will do. It pulls back the deceit of a sinful life and one full of despair being filled with the Spirit, worshiping God and praising Him, gives us a glimpse into heaven on this side of eternity. Let me say that one more time. Being filled with the Spirit, worshiping God with song, praising and giving Him thanks for all things, gives us a glimpse into heaven on this side of eternity. These graces of intimacy with God and full worship of him are only but a foretaste of heaven. The best is yet to come for the children of God. So let's enjoy this slice of eternity that's been afforded to us. Let us praise God for all he has given us. Let's 
turn our attention away from the areas of lack or the areas of despair or the areas that we feel envious of other people. And let us focus on what God has so, so abundantly poured out on us already. Praise the Lord. Give thanks and glory and all honor to him alone. So let us as one church continue to glorify his name. And let us shine brightly for him when we do that. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us all that we need in this life to be contented and satisfied. God, help and teach us to move our attention away from the areas that we, we feel lack, that we feel despair, that we feel aren't good enough compared to other people. God, help us to fix our eyes on the abundance that you've already given us. Help us fix our eyes on the God who is good, who does hear his people's prayers. Help us to fix our eyes on you and to be satisfied and to be contented. Lord, teach us to walk with one another as a church in this way. Help us to be open and authentic with our shortcomings, of our envy, of our coveting, of our sin with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Now is the time for us to reflect on the sermon, reflect on God's word to us, reflect on whether God has convicted your heart about your life or about um, just your faith. So to, in order to do that, we want to have a time of confession and assurance of pardon. And if God has convicted your heart this morning, we want, us, we want us to come before God and just be able to confess that and be able to repent. So let's spend a moment of just silence um, as we just reflect on the message, but then go into a moment of just confession. God, we pray that you would forgive us for how we've used our mouths, if we used our mouths for foolish talk, if we used our mouths in a way that has dishonored you, if we've, if, we've, if we've enjoyed or if we've found ourselves enjoying gossip more than truth. God, I pray that you would forgive us because you have created us not to be people who use our mouths to dishonor you or other people, but Lord, you've created our mouths to be people of worship. You have created us to be people who declare the, the wonders and the greatness of God and the renown of God. So God, we pray that you would forgive us for the ways that we've used our mouths. God, we pray for forgiveness for where there is idolatry in our lives for where we have allowed our own desires to rule over us, where we want to do whatever we want to do, no matter how immoral or wrong it is, God, we come before you to ask you to fill us with your spirit that we may have that new life that you give to us. So God, we come and we ask that you would um, as we just come and lay before you our sin and our confessions, Lord, we just grab a hold of the grace that you give to us, that where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And so, God, we just look to the cross, and we know that if we confess, Lord, there is mercy for us in Jesus Christ. So thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. Thank you for your spirit that is working in us.
We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.